Yo, this is TK Coleman. Welcome to the Revolution of One live stream. We're back again with What Now, Kamau, and Stro from Stro Opinion to talk about Last Dance Life Lessons. But before we dive into the story of Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls, I want to start off with a fact or fiction hot take. Fact or fiction, LeBron James had tougher competition than Michael Jordan. Stro, what you think? Fiction. Brad? Fiction. <laughs> Fiction. You sound confident. Fiction. There's, there's no way you can compare. Uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't even say compare. I just think that it's an excuse. So if, if you're talking about who Jordan faced, uh, you talk about uh, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, Patrick Ewing, uh, Dominique Wilkins, uh, just to say a few. And then you talk about LeBron James. You talk about guys like Dwight Howard. DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry, uh, you know, stop me. So there's, there's okay. no way. <laughs> there's no way that that's a fact. There's no way. Okay, that I can't let you. Get, I can't let you get away with Dwight Howard. <laughs> okay, hold up. Okay, so we can't just name all the great players of Jordan's era who happened to be in the league at the same time and make a comparison on that basis. We got to talk about who they had to go up against, who they had to get through to get to the finals and get over the hump. So when we look at LeBron, he had to go up against a 73-win Warriors team, right, who is considered the greatest regular season team of all time. And they had three future Hall of Famers. Then he has to play against that team plus another MVP. You got four future Hall of Famers, two former MVPs on the same squad. LeBron had to go up against those guys or, you know, some combination of them every year for four years straight to get a final. And, you know, we hold it against him that he only came out with one against the Warriors team, but that was a stacked team. I don't know if Jordan had to go up against more than two Hall of Famers or two, like, mega superstars in the same series. Then LeBron has to beat a Spurs team with Kawhi, Ginobili, Tony Parker, Tim Duncan. Again, we got like four future, four Hall of Famers. What, what's wrong with this argument, man? So let's talk about let's talk about Michael Jordan's road to the finals first. Because all of his competition was faced there. So in the second year in the playoffs, he goes against Larry Bird. And and that stacked, come on, man. The 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 Celtics in the 80s. Uh, and then you then the bad boys, and then a Knicks team who who went to the finals when he left the NBA was a stacked team. And I think what what happened with these young kids, they look at they look at these guys now and act like that Michael Jordan didn't play in the finals against Matty Johnson and a team full of Hall of Famers. Uh, then he goes against uh, Clyde Drexler and a very very good uh, Portland Trailblazer team. And then he goes against another Hall of Famer in, in Phoenix with, with uh, Charles Barkley and a, a team full of shooters and up young and upcoming players. I'm talking about, at the time, teams that he played, he had, uh, I believe, he all, his, the records of the teams that he won, that he beat, were better than the records that it, outside of the 73-9 and nine team that LeBron had to go against. But Michael Jordan's road and his journey to the, the NBA championship is always what sticks out more. And so LeBron James in, in those times, and I'm not taking anything away from him. You, you can't uh, not give a guy some kind of regard that goes to the finals that many times in a row. But you also have to point out how weak the road was to get there, um, to get to the finals and then get there and then uh, lose as many times as he did. Now, Michael Jordan faced, I mean, when he played two, year, two years in a row, he beat the Utah Jazz, and those teams were great teams with two, un I mean, you don't, two Hall of Famers on that team down in history. I'm talking about historical players that uh, Michael Jordan played against, even with the Phoenix Suns, I'm, I'm sorry, but the Seattle Super Suns, who won a lot of games. These aren't, these, and at the time, these are the best players in the league at that time. These are the best players. So I don't know how you can gauge that. Um, when we talk about competition, because when you, you the only way you can do it is it was he doing it against the best players in the NBA at the time, and he was, and he was. So fiction. Yeah, you, you, you know one thing, one thing, one thing I'll give you is that I think it's easier to see competition as tougher when that competition beats you, 
right? Yeah. Um, I, I remember Mike Tyson used to say, uh, before Mike Tyson fights, they would say, oh, this guy's gonna be the toughest fighter he's ever faced. This guy is somebody that Tyson should not take for granted. And I remember seeing Tyson in an interview and he said, okay, what are you gonna say when I beat this guy? Th then you're gonna say he was easy for me. When I knock him out in the first round, you're gonna say I didn't have any competition. Competition. So just remember what you're saying now after I knock him out in the first round. And, and, and I think exactly. the way Jordan demolished Drexler in the finals was so profound that we kind of forget what the conversation was like before they played each other in the finals. At that point, it was like, oh, Jordan Drexler, who's the best? And we don't look at that as tough competition because Jordan really overcame him. But hey, absolutely. Let, let, let me go back to but let me let me go back to some of LeBron's comp though. Because LeBron, before he was teamed up with Wade and Bosch, before he had Kyrie and Kevin Love, when he was on weak Cleveland teams, since the time he was a rookie, he dragged that yeah. team to the final against a Detroit Pistons team that I think you'd have to give it to them that they were superior. You might want to say Detroit choked, but that was a good team that in in you know had demolished a Kobe and Shaq Lakers team in the finals. Gary Payton, Karl Malone, Kobe, Shaq Lakers team, those Pistons smashed those guys. And LeBron did what those four could not do, essentially by himself. And I remember that game where like just they just kept feeding him the rock and he would just take it to the hole and it it looked like he was toying with that Pistons team, the same Pistons team that we see bully other people. Like he was toying with them as if they were children. They couldn't do anything. I remember Antonio McDice on the bench crying, you know, even though the series wasn't over and they were still in a position where they could have won it. He's crying because it's like, we can't do anything with this guy. And they made, they made it to the finals and nobody expected them to win because they went up against the Spurs team that was very superior. So LeBron has proven his ability to bring a mediocre team all the way to the finals even against superior competition. So I see what you're saying about Jordan playing those Celtics teams, but Jordan and the Bulls, they lost to those Celtics teams. For LeBron and his Detroit team, he overcame it. Yeah, I, I think that I don't I've never uh I've never argued against that. I think that's that's one badge uh that I, I do give LeBron James the way he um dismantled that Detroit team by himself. But it's so it's so few of those times that he did that. Now, Michael Jordan uh, losing to the Celtics, he looked at it as a step in the journey, as as like he lost to the Pistons. He looked at it as a step in the journey. So I'll, I'm not gonna go try to reload or re-up and get somebody to help me. No, I'm gonna take the guys that I have and I'm gonna beat this team that beat me because I, I feel more honorable about destroying the team that kept me down for so long um, that just makes me look better that I, I go back to the drawing board, take the guys that I have with me back to the drawing board and say, hey, we're going to beat these guys the next time. I'm not going to say, hey, I can't beat these guys. So I thought that when LeBron James, when he went to the finals, I was excited because, man, this, this young kid's going to be something. But it never happened again. It never happened again. After that, he, after a couple of more years uh, with him being the, the star by himself, he said, I can't do this alone. I got to go get my guys, and then I'll go to the NBA Finals, and then I'll still lose uh, six times out of nine. Yeah, you know, we talk about LeBron as the guy with not enough help who has to go up against these superior teams. But there's one year I remember, and I don't remember it because I intend to use it as a criticism of him, but I remember it because it was probably the most disappointing playoff to me. It was the year that Kobe and LeBron was supposed to square off in the finals. I don't know if you guys remember yes. this, but they had that commercial campaign with the Kobe and LeBron puppets because each of those yes. guys were the king of their conferences and they had the better team. And the, the Cavs that year were the number one seed in the East and they had a fantastic season and they looked great coming into the playoffs. And it was looked at as a foregone conclusion in everybody's minds. We're getting ready to see the Kobe versus LeBron final. And the Cavs came out just gunning at the Orlando Magic. And Orlando Magic had that Dwight Howard center and those other shooters around them. And I remember watching that first half of that game where Cleveland just came out and smashed them. I think they were up by like 20. LeBron hit the buzzer shot. 
And then systematically, Orlando just started to pick them apart. They started hitting their threes, picking them apart. And they end up upsetting Cleveland in that series. And LeBron never made it to the finals. Kobe did his, his job, made it to the finals, ended up winning. And we never got a chance to see that square off. And that is one example of LeBron actually going up against a team where they where his team were the favorites and they weren't able to, to deliver. So, yeah, it's definitely a more nuanced debate. I, I hate to defend the LeBron position because you know how much I love him, Jay. But, uh, but I, I tried the best that I can. K Kamal, you, you, you want to chime in on this or should we dive into some last dance? I mean, just last, just real quick, last thoughts. I mean, it, it, it's a hard debate, right? And, and, and personally, I can't really justify, um, you know, the, the, the ups and downs that really either player, you know, it, it's hard to compare. I think what's clear is that a lot of people, um, you want to glance over how, how talented, how stacked, how just dynamic that bull, I mean, that, um, that Golden State Warriors team was, I think, if Jordan and his Bulls would have played that, like I'm not convinced that they would just beat them. I'm I'm not convinced that I'm not convinced that Jordan and 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 their championship teams could beat the Golden State Warriors with their fully stacked, fully healthy roster. Um, I think it would be a battle of the Titans, but I'm not convinced. And so to say that that LeBron didn't have the tough competition, I think is inaccurate. I don't think. He had tougher competition, but he definitely had a lot of competition going against those Warriors. I listen. I know we got to move on, but I can. There's no way <laughs> that I can sit here and let you say that my either one of the three P teams would would not beat uh, uh, any one of those teams. Would have now. I'm not saying that that team wasn't talented because the way Steph, uh, Steph Curry shoots the basketball and and Clay shoots the basketball and Draymond Green. But first of all, the Bulls were too big. Um, they defended too well, and they would have slowed those guys down easily. But, hey, it's your opinion. I guess it matters. Hey, hey to, yeah, to, this to your point, this is, this is This is the rough one, so it matters on here. <laughs> hey, hey, man, but, but people do underestimate, though, just how good those teams were defensively. I, I can't say the yeah. Warriors faced a team that was as good defensively anywhere near the same league as those Bulls teams. Like Rodman, one of the best defenders in history. Jordan and Scotty, two of the best defenders in history. And, and here's where people get twisted on Jordan really quickly. If I can go on a tangent. When people think all-around player, they tend to think only in terms of rebounds and assists. They, they don't yeah. think about all-around as anything else, which is why people think it's just so obvious that LeBron was a better all-around player. But defense somehow gets left out of this debate, you know? But Jordan had 10 trips to the all-defensive team, first team every time. <clears throat> More th That's almost twice as many. Well, I think LeBron may have made it like six times. Jordan led the league in steals on three occasions. LeBron never led the league in steals once. Jordan actually averages over career the same amount of blocks as LeBron. Jordan is the only person in NBA history who was the MVP, scoring leader, and defensive player of the year in the same season. LeBron never won defensive player of the year. So if we compare defensively, I'm not talking about highlights. I'm not talking about what's etched in your memory. I'm talking about what LeBron fans love, statistics. Jordan is a superior defender. He's done things that nobody else in his class can do. And I think people just kind of leave that out. And so that team, man, I think the key to answering that question, who would win, is whose rules are we playing under? Are we playing like 90s rules where I can punch you in the face and that's just a foul? <laughs> because Rodman's going to have his way. You know what I mean? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a different series for Steph Curry if, if he has to play on the 90s rules. Or are we playing, no, you can't breathe on a guy and, you know, and that's a foul. Well, then Jordan's getting like 90 points if we can't breathe on you, right? So it's kind of it's kind of tough to say, but it's a fun discussion. But let's let's get into last dance, man, because yeah, I feel like hey, we could do this for two You set us up for the okie doke, man. You you this is debating whether the chicken or the egg came first. We're halfway through, and we're still talking about this back. Hey, I, 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 did you freeze? Okay, we good. Yeah, let's dive into this last dance. Kick us off, come cool. on, what we got? 
Yeah, so I think what we start with um, is is just Jordan's relationship with his father. Um, obviously, in episode seven, um, right after they're coming off of their three peat, this tragedy happens um, with MJ with MJ's father. You know, he was on the way um, back home and he pulled over and was um, went missing for three weeks and then was found um, murdered in in this creek. And, you know, I, I think this one is, you know, touching because for me, like, I know how much, how big of a role my dad has played in my success thus far and how much he's contributed to my mindset, to my work ethic, um, uh, to my mentality, to my self-awareness, to, to all the positive traits that I think I bring to really any situation. Um, my dad has played a part in that. And um, TK, I've met your dad, Stro. I haven't met yours, but you know, I, I know how big of an imprint um, TK had on not only him, but you know, everybody within in, within the church, everybody within the community. Um, and dads just they have that power to to where they can just put such a, a positive or negative imprint um, that is life changing. And I think um, MJ's dad um, put one that allowed him to be the MJ that you know, we came to see and, 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 and allowed him to build the legacy that he did. So, you know, I think this is a broader conversation of, of not only Jordan's relationship with his father, but how dads play into, you know, how dads play into, you know, this DNA of greatness in, in, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that one of the things that I, that's stuck out a lot is that you just noticed um, even growing up watching Michael Jordan, play that his dad was always uh there um a lot of times you know we like now we see a lot of the um what a lot of the conversation was and all that thing but back then we didn't know but you just saw him and it's like like my my own father you know he's always been uh there he's always been present you know and he's always given words of wisdom and he's always uh his leash hasn't been that tight but he'd always, after you made whatever decision you made, there's always a conversation about uh, what better choice you could have made. And he was always available for whatever questions that I had. Um, and that has always played a very important role in my life. But I remember the neighborhood that I grew up in that you can count on one hand how many fathers um, were in the home with my, with my friends. Uh, on my on my particular block, I can remember just two dads out of the whole block, and my father was one of them. Um, and how important that was to our rearing, and how important that was to our upcoming. And there were a lot of us, like uh, it was eight eight kids, and my dad had the ability to deal with each of us according to our own personality. So when you when you saw um, Michael Jordan's father with him all the time and the the influence was obvious um and i just thought it was just good to see uh a black dad who was there and how much influence and how much he meant to michael jordan it was it was obvious um when the emotions were there you know uh with the tragic loss of his dad and how that how i felt i felt that that impacted a lot of his decisions immediately after that because of his um, relationship with his father. Yeah, you know, um, Jerry Krause gets a lot of flack for saying organizations win championships. And I think part of the reason he gets that flack is because Mike being so charming, everybody's gonna take his side. I know I'm gonna take his side. If him and Krause get into a fight, I'm on Jordan's side. But there was something that Krause was getting at that I think is absolutely true. And that is none of us come out of a vacuum. None of us achieve greatness independently of the systems and the communities that we are a part of. And it makes an interesting story to treat Jordan like this demigod, this mythical figure who accomplished everything for no other reason than that he made up his mind he was gonna succeed. And we kind of overlook the fact that Jordan had mentors in his life, father figures in his life who gave him wisdom, gave him guidance on how to harness that energy constructively. You know, and I think of a couple of critical moments with his father. One time in the finals, Jordan was getting off to a really slow start and went to his father for advice. And his father told him, you're forcing it. 
He says, don't force it. Get your teammates involved and then let the game come to you. And uh, and he did that. And then there was another time he told him the opposite. You're trying to get your teammates involved too much. You need to be the leader, step up and take charge. When it came to the Nike and Adidas deal, Jordan was blowing Nike off. He didn't think that was a good deal. And it was his father who told him, hey, you got to be the one to do that. And you can't talk about Jordan's impact on the culture or all of these championships just in terms of him being this hard-nosed, competitive guy. It was he had that father in his life. And, and, and I think we all need people, whether it's a biological father or a spiritual father or spiritual you know, brothers and sisters, we all need people who can challenge us to step outside of our own natural way of thinking and see life from another point of view. Because no matter how smart you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter how gifted you are, there are other ways of seeing reality that are useful that you're just not gonna come up with. And, and that's what Jordan's father symbolizes that aspect of success to me. Yeah, and I think after that first three-peat um, and, and, and then the stuff came out, you know, during that last final series, just about Jordan gambling and, you know, going to uh, the casino and then all the other uh, backstories of his gambling habits kind of really came to fruition. Um, it, you know, based on the documentary, it was kind of told that the media just took these two separate occurrences and, and created a story where um, Jordan's dad was murdered because of Michael, uh, uh, James Jordan was murdered because of Michael Jordan's gambling. Um, and, and I think that was incredibly tough, right? That's especially if that's, you know, your best friend, even if you know, in your heart of hearts, um, you know, you want to believe that's not true when, when, when you're constantly getting bombarded by the media, when your life you know, belongs to the public. When you are this demigod, I think that was thrown in his face again and again and again. And that led him, um, on top of all the pressure he had already been feeling, to to a certain exhaustion where um, he kind of just wanted to be away from the game. And I think that kind of transitions us into this, this phase of Jordan's life where he retired from basketball. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear both of you guys' opinions on it because it just from the documentary and from what I've researched and watched about it, it was a huge, huge, huge deal. Like it looked like a presidential debate, how much media coverage this thing got. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, his stint with playing basketball, you know, the general narrative is just that like he kind of needed it. He needed that time away from the game. To, to reset and to kind of step back into this competitor that he was. Um, the last thing I'll say about this was that during the, during the game, um, well, not even during the, during a White Sox game, uh, Jerry Krause and Jerry, the other Jerry, the owner of the Bulls met in like Jerry a box Reinsdorf. office. Yeah, Jerry Reinsdorf met in a box office and they talked about you know, that Jordan wanted to leave basketball. And so the story leaks at the stadium where, you know, they're in the middle of a game and like the media is going crazy. The The baseball game no longer is relevant. It's, is Jordan really leaving basketball? And, um, you know, I think Michael Jordan, ha Michael Jordan had a sped off and uh, the owner and Jerry Krause had to kind of duck away, but it, it was just a really intense 48 hours. You know, is Michael Jordan leaving? I don't think anybody could rationalize why, and that's kind of just where it left us. Yeah, I, re I remember that day like it was yesterday, you know, like um, because I was like a serious Michael Jordan fan and, and we had just won the, we had just won the title and, and all of this, you can hear this stuff happening. Of course, not, not like it is now, like the, the there's no social media, anything like this, but you would hear like ramblings later on the news. And um, I remember saying like, there's no way Michael Jordan is retiring from basketball after, you know, winning the championship. He's still the best player uh, in the world. Um, but it indeed was true. Uh, I can remember being devastated and I can remember like all of the conversations afterwards because there's no way in our minds, in our minds that we thought that someone can be on top of the world dominating the NBA I mean, mm. he's like nothing we've mm. ever seen. We were expecting him to win one more championship. We're just after it because they were there was no problems 
basketball wise as we could see. And so because of that, then all of the speculations then did start like, you know, um, he must have had something to do with his dad's death. It must have the gambling um, the league is, you know, like it came up in the documentary, the, the league is suspending him um, for his gambling. He must it must be something that we don't know um, because just it just didn't make sense to us that Michael Jordan would retire. And then, like, you know, all of this, like, I'm going to go play baseball, these things. I remember having a conversation with a couple of my friends, like, after we were playing basketball, like, uh, this this baseball thing is a fluke, that he's doing this because he's obviously in some kind of trouble because there's no way that Michael Jordan is finished. But, you know, watching the documentary and then you start to see all of the pressure that had to be, you know, that he was surrounded with, uh, with being the best guy. You know, he had won three in a row. Like, well, how much more is there to prove? Um, my dad's gone. You know, this gambling stuff is coming up. So just as, like now, being a man and realizing the type of pressure that it comes with being um, the best player, the most, the, the most noticed or most famous athlete in the world, and, you know, at that time, just being so protective of his image, his brand, and all of this pressure surrounding him. And then with that sort of emotional thing with losing someone like your father um, on top of all of that um, had to be devastating. So he, he now listening to it and, you know, before now, you know, you know, all the pressures that he had to be going to going through. It seemed like he just needed a mental break. I don't think that he. Uh, ever thought that he was finished all the way. That's why he left the door open at the at the press conference. But I do think that his father, like if his father didn't die, I think he would have kept playing. But with his father dying, I think he just needed a break from all of it. Yeah, if, if you want to appreciate how much pressure Jordan had to live through, go look at the ratings when he retired. Go look at what happened to the NBA and how boring it became to people, how uninterested so many people became when he retired. And, and, and that'll help you draw the distinction between what it was like in Mike's day versus today. Because some people may say, wow, he cracked under that kind of pressure. Boy, he would have never made it in the age of Twitter and Instagram. But, but I, I think what that perspective overlooks is that today, that kind of attention is distributed over so many people. There are so many influencers, so many celebrities, so many athletes, even just within the NBA, that are constantly chattering, letting us know what they're eating, who they're partying with. There's so much gossip. Gossip is now a 24-hour constant stream in, in the celebrity world. And so it's highly distributed. In Jordan's day, the NBA didn't know what it was like before Jordan to build its entire brand around a single entity. He carried that load himself in a way that wasn't really shared by anybody else who had that kind of way. You had other guys who were well known, but Jordan pretty much carried the NBA brand on his back. And you could see that and feel that when he retired. It was like the NBA was desperately searching for who's the next Jordan, who's the next Jordan. And you could see that fatigue on him. He was just tired, he was worn out. And, and, and like Stro said, you know, once he's got blamed for his father's death, it's like, ah, you know, it's one thing to, uh, to lose, to lose your main man. It's another thing for, for that to be put on you. But, you know, one, one thing I'll, I'll say, just in a different direction, his baseball career, uh, th that's the aspect of his life that I think I find most inspiring because it represents the value of pursuing things that are in your heart to pursue, even if you can't justify those things to other people and even if you don't succeed. Michael Jordan doesn't owe anybody an apology for having a crazy dream, for chasing his childhood dream and not being successful at it. He did the right move. Why? Because he was great at it? No, because that was what was in his heart. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a guarantee that you'll be great at something in order to, for it to be worth pursuing. Because when you pursue things that are important to you, it contributes to your spiritual evolution in a way that's so much bigger than success. And I'm glad he went to go do that because he needed to discover something about himself. And when he came back to the game, I think he was better off for it. I don't want to see a world where he stays and doesn't do that because then we lose out on that story of seeing how he how he handled it, you know. Yeah, and if there I could just two. add one more, 
It's go like, ahead. I'm go sorry. ahead. Yeah. In fact, one thing it's, uh, even when he went there, one thing that was noticeable to me too is that he worked just as hard at it. Like he he really wanted to be good at baseball. And I, I think I can remember one of the guys saying, one of the baseball guys saying is this, if Michael Jordan had the opportunity to get 1,500 at bats, that he would have been that much better. And he had no um, no doubt that Mike would have made, made it to the major leagues just because of his work ethic. Would he have been the Michael Jordan of baseball? Probably not. But just in his core was this work ethic and this competitiveness and just going to get what he wanted. There were two things that I found really interesting about that whole segment that I'd actually like to to revisit and talk about with y'all. One was that when he went to Jerry Reinsdorf and said, hey, I'm thinking about playing baseball. I'm done with basketball. He was like, look, I can't convince you otherwise, but I'm not going to allow you to do this, make this decision without going to talk to Phil first. He goes to talk to Phil and runs the idea by him. Phil is obviously very empathetic, but one of the things that stood out to me that Phil was, Phil, during this discussion that they kept talking about was like, you have this this God-given ability, this gift, and essentially you're taking that away from society. You're taking that away from all the fans. You're taking that away from all the, the the young kids who look up to you. And I kind of felt like Phil was pressuring Michael to, instead of go with his heart, to, to, um, to do society this service by continuing to perform at this level. This, and, and, and just to, that that should be factored into your decision. And I guess it should, but I'd, I'd love to hear where you guys stand about that. Um with with him just just ask the question one more time Coy. like what what yeah i i think just like if if phil jackson felt that michael jordan almost owed something to society that you you should keep, continue to keep playing because you're playing at such an ability that nobody else can duplicate you're changing the game so for you to stop playing is for you to take away you know this gift to the world Oh no, like I, I think that each individual, as we alluded to earlier, like you don't owe at that point he had given a lot and we we experienced it and, and all of that. But I think that you as an individual, you have to know what you need to do for you. And I think that at that point, at that point, no, no matter how I felt about it, because I was devastated, I wish he would have kept going. But as TK said, we don't get to experience the the other side of it if he doesn't. And then internally, we just don't know what was in Michael. And and he saw it as an opportunity to say, hey, um, I'm going to go try to play baseball. I'm going to do it. And I'm doing it for me, um, no matter what we were experiencing as a people or as fans of his greatness. That doesn't give us the, the right to tell a guy um, not to pursue a childhood dream and you have that opportunity uh, uh, to do it. And th- those, even though it's Michael Jordan, that opportunity doesn't present itself if the situation wasn't what it was at the time. So absolutely, I, I absolutely think that Michael Jordan did the best thing and that was what he wanted to do for him. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't think he, he took away his gifts from the world. I think he continued to share those gifts with the world in the form of his example and his pursuits, but it was in his own way. And and I think that's a good illustration of the fact that sometimes the people in your life who love you, who are mentors, people that you respect, they don't always have the best idea for how you should use your gifts, you know? Um, And and sometimes you gotta, you you gotta listen to them. You gotta listen to them respectfully and consider what they have to say, but you kind of have to weigh it against what's in your own heart. Um, Along these same lines though, as Jordan is playing baseball, one, one thing I want to talk about, you know I, know, I know we got like 15 minutes left. I want to talk about what things were like in Chicago. As Jordan is pursuing his baseball dream, now we got the Bulls coming off a championship year. They got Scotty now in that position of being the lead. And Scotty has been known as like the best sidekick in, in, in the history of the NBA for the most part. He's, he's the Robin to Jordan's Batman. And now he's put in the alpha position. And um, Scotty had a pretty amazing breakout year. 
Um, the, the Bulls just were a few games short of, of winning 50 games. They had a good playoff run. Scotty uh, went to the All-Star game and, and was the MVP of the All-Star game. Uh, I think with the exception of maybe like blocks uh, and rebounds, he led the Bulls in multiple statistical categories. And, and there was some midseason debate. Is Scotty the best all-around player in the NBA? It doesn't get talked about because there's a moment that overshadows it all and that pretty much right. defines Scotty's year without Michael. It's the single moment where they're in the playoffs against their old rival, the New York Knicks. It comes down to the final shot, and uh, Phil Jackson calls the play for Kukoc. And it's a play that he's run before many times. Kukoc has delivered on it, and Phil's got the confidence in him. And Scotty feels like, man, this is my moment. I'm the alpha. I got us here. And he felt like it was an insult. And so as an act of protest, he was like, I'm out. And he sat on the bench and protested. And then <laughs> Kukoc hits the shot. He hits the shot and the Bulls win the game and it makes Scotty look even worse. And um, and pretty much the whole consensus of that documentary, everybody, Jordan, Phil, they all said, you know, Scotty was wrong for that. But, you know, he got over it. He apologized to the team and went on. But Scotty said something that was interesting to me and I want to get y'all take on it. Scotty said, you know, would I have done it differently? Probably not. Scotty said he probably would have made the same choice. So I want to I want to hear from y'all. Did Scotty make the right call? You take Scotty's side, or you agree with Jordan Cartwright Phil's criticism of him? Um, I don't. Uh, I remember the moment. I remember watching the game, and I remember uh, Scotty not coming out, like you know, wanting to know what's going on. I'm, I'm just I'm a team guy. Um, and listen, Scotty Pippen had an amazing season, and he did what a lot of us. Some of us thought he could, but I don't know if we were really thinking that he would take that Bulls team as far as he did. Uh, but in that particular moment, when he didn't come out on the floor, I I just, I thought it was just so, I thought it was bad. I thought it was like a bad look. I, You can't sit out of a game ever. You know, it, it just looks like you're giving up on a team. It looks like you're, um, you know, with the team, it's all about me anyway. And I, I just didn't like it. What uh, One of the things that, that I did notice, that I didn't notice um, during the time, because you know you're so emotionally involved in it, was the, how hard Bill Cartwright was trying to get him to not make that choice. And I remember being the guy, I, I've been the Bill Cartwrights in those situations, you know, going, because I've now, you know, I was never the best player on the team, you know what I mean? So I was, I was that guy <laughs> on the bench, like, Hey, hey, you know, don't do it this way, blah, 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 whatever. And like him still like disregarding uh, that advice from a veteran, like trying to let him know or trying to let him this, you're going to wear this for the rest of your life. And it's like you said, it tarnished what was one of the greatest individual accomplishments um, in the league that, that, I, that I think. And him saying that he would do it all over again. It's just letting me know that Scotty, and I've always said this about Scotty. Scotty's always been an emotional guy, and and I think his emotions kept him from a lot of the 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 talks about him being like greater than he what what he was. Now we give him a lot of credit, but I think if his emotions have always kept him in certain a, a certain place, and him saying that he would have done it again only let me know that. He's still that guy. Like his emotions are what are are what rule him. His emotions are what rule him, and so I think that's I that that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Come on. I think for my, if 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 I could weigh in, I think that this is the danger of ego. Like mm -hmm. that that is your ego at its at its fullest. Um, most dangerous level, like on the highest stage, you're willing to choose perception over performance, right? You're willing to sit out and rob your teammates of what you've committed to them because of this own inner story that you have. And I think, you know, people have called it by a lot of names, but what I, what it comes to me as is like your story, story that yourself that you were now the alpha dog that you've replaced Michael Jordan 
in that not only does the team need you, but the team can't succeed without you. And that because of that, it needs to go your way. And I think certain players have the ability, right, to, where their career is kind of like that, where it's Kobe, where it's Michael, these, these alpha dogs who've established themselves and have put in the work and have the relationship with not only their teammates, but the coaching staff and the organization. Just that's who they are. They're the alpha dog. But with that comes a lot that, you know, we don't necessarily know about. A lot of stuff that happens behind the scene to establish yourself as that alpha dog kind of player. I think Scotty is hyper talented, but at the end of the day, like, I think he got more so caught up in trying to step into this Michael Jordan, um, you know, hyper, hyper alpha kind of player rather than just being himself, being the excellent team player that he was. And, right. and and trying to win ball games. I think one of the things that Steve Kerr said, because they were really excited when Michael left, frankly. Like, you know, Scotty was the nicer guy. He was the guy who's the better team player. And there wasn't as much animosity on the Bulls when Michael left. Um, I think Steve Kerr's exact quotes was that Michael would just bludgeon everyone around him, but Scotty had a much softer touch. And I think at that moment, at that highest level, when it really mattered, he allowed that ego to, to make him somebody that he wasn't. He was a team player guy. He was the guy who wasn't trying to score all the time, but that would pass and want the team to win. And I think his ego just took over in the moment. And, and even to this day, like Stroh was saying, I, I think that's still ego. I think I don't, it's not even emotions to me. It's just ego that like, you're not a mil uh, uh, you're not willing to admit that it was a mistake that 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 you choosing your ego over the team was the wrong decision and he, obviously like he's had to pay those consequences but i think being a star at that level your ego just gets magnified of course it's hard to admit you're wrong when you have the news the media you know all your teammates just like Tell us you're wrong. Like he apologized in the locker room, but I think, you know, when all the cameras, it's hard to say, you know, I, I messed up guys. My ego got in the way. I think that, that, that just becomes that much harder when you have all that pressure and all that media and you're this public figure. But yeah, that, that's the danger of ego in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate with you guys' position here. Um, so you know, I think about this verse in the Bible that says a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Um, and, and, and one of the things I take away from that is whatever you do, if you want it to work, you got to go all the way with it. You got to own it 100 percent. And we're talking a lot about ego, but we're also talking about that within the context of a conversation where we're praising a guy who had the biggest ego of all time. You know, and, and Jordan was flat out wrong about a lot of stuff. I love Jordan. He's a major hero. But his ego was so bad that he literally made up fictitious narratives about other people insulting him in order to motivate himself <laughs> and then proceeded to treat those other people poorly based on his own hallucination. I mean, you want to talk about ego. But the reason that it worked for him is because he went all the way. And I think Scotty's problem was that he didn't go all the way with his position. I ask myself, if Jordan was in that position, would that have ever happened? And I can't imagine it happening. There's no way Phil picks Kukoc over Jordan. If Kukoc shoots the last shot, I'm telling you now, Jordan is the one that decides that. That ball comes through Jordan. I, I look at it in the episode, they talked about Gary Payton and Carm uh, George Carl had a moment where George Carl keeps telling Gary Payton, I don't want you guarding Jordan, even down to the, to the last two games. And Gary Payton said he got to a point where he was like, man, forget that. And he told George Carl, no, I'm guarding Michael Jordan. And George Carl didn't want it. And Gary Payne said, this is what's happening. Basically, if you put me out on the floor, I'm telling you what's happening, coach. And if Gary Payton had got burned really badly, we would be making fun of him for that. But he played better than anybody else that guarded Jordan. And so now that gets to be looked at as kind of legendary. You know, I think if Scotty really wanted to be the alpha, he had to understand that nobody gives you permission to be the alpha. Nobody's going to say, hey, it's your turn to be alpha now, Scotty. The definition of alpha is you step up and you say, it's my rock. I'm taking over the team. You really want to be alpha? 
You look at Phil in the eye and you say, I'm shooting this ball. You look at Kukoc, you say, you give me the ball. And if Phil says, no, 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 Scotty, run the play, you say, okay, sure thing, Phil. And then when the play starts, you take the ball, you shoot the shot. And if you win, everybody in history praises you. We're not having this conversation. Yeah. And we look at that as the moment where he was an alpha. And if he misses, then we have the same conversation where he looks like an idiot. But that's what it means to be an alpha. Like, you can't wait for anybody to pick you. But here's my other thing I say. I actually do assign a little bit of blame to Phil. Phil gets credit in that moment for making the correct basketball play because they won the game. But I say, whoa, let's not be too fast to praise that because they did lose the series. They did lose the series. And I think they lost the series because they lost Scotty. The, the documentary brushes over it and makes it look like, and after that, after Bill Cartwright talked to him, he was the perfect guy and he got over it. And we see today, 20 years later, he's still not over that moment. He's still bitter about it. He didn't get over it. I, I think as a coach, sometimes there's a moment to signal to the people that you need that you're my guy. What did Dell Harris do with Kobe? He says, Kobe is your shot. And Kobe shot an air ball. Kobe flat out failed the team. What did Dell Harris do? Kobe, you got it again. Kobe failed the team. What did Dell Harris do? Kobe, you got it again. Kobe shot an air ball four times. And Dale Harris signaled to Kobe, I don't care if you shoot an air ball eight times, bro. You're my guy. We're winning or losing on you being the man to take that shot. You don't think that had a, a, an effect on Kobe's mindset? From a coaching standpoint, it's very powerful to look at a dude in the eye and say, hey, all these other guys, I love Ku Coach, I love Kerr, but we ain't going to win no championship without you being my main man. And I think Phil had an opportunity to do that. And I think there was something at stake that was more important than running the correct basketball play. And uh, I think Phil got lucky. If Kukoc doesn't hit that shot, we're having an entirely different conversation. And Phil's going to be criticized for not managing his personalities, for not keeping Scotty's head in the game. So that was a very lucky moment for Phil. But I, I think we might have seen a different outcome had Phil been the one to signal to Scotty, hey, man, I trust you. You got us here. You take us home. And um you know, Phil couldn't have gone wrong with that decision. If Scotty misses, it's on Scotty. But if Scotty hits, what does that do for his ego then? What does that do for his career? But at the end of the but day, to, man, it's Scotty's responsibility to step up and be alpha. Yeah, I, I think what the honestly, you kind of contradicted yourself here because you said that alpha players aren't given permission. They take it. Um, and I think for 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 Phil to have to give permission to Scotty is a contradiction. Like Phil, Phil just played the chess moves based off of the pieces he had. He knew that Scotty had the double mind. You know, he, he, he knows what kind of player he has. And I think he went with the safest play at the time. Um, I, 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 I agree 100% that if Scotty was the alpha that Scotty, that, that would have already been known. There, there shouldn't be a question at that stage. But I think everything leading up to that already gave Phil all the information he needed to make the decision. So to me, I, I think it's just a contradiction yeah. to, to, to say that Phil, the mistake was on Phil because he didn't give permission to the alpha dog to take that shot. No, no, I, I, think, I think a more precise way to put it is both of them share responsibility in the moment. I, I don't think Phil made a mistake because he didn't give the alpha dog permission to take the shot. Because the alpha dog don't need permission. If Scotty was the alpha dog, he would have just taken the shot and said, screw you, Phil. I'm doing what I want to do, right? But I think Phil dealing with a guy who wasn't an alpha dog, dealing with the guy who does need to be told, I trust in you. Because Jordan don't need to be told that. Jordan doesn't need Phil to say, I believe in you. But I think Scotty needed that. And I think as a coach, you've got to know what kind of guy you're dealing with. And if you're dealing with somebody that's not an alpha and they need you to say, I trust you, I think it's important to discern that and then put it in their hands. But I don't think Scotty was an alpha. And I don't think Phil made a mistake by not giving the alpha permission. If Scotty was an alpha, he would have taken the permission. He would have just stepped up and did it. Hey, hey but let, let's close with this last question, man. Uh, if we can just have another minute. W one of the, the last themes in this documentary was how Jordan is just so vicious, so mean to his teammates and like push these guys because winning was everything to him. I'm seeing a lot of talk on social media, a lot of articles being written that basically say Jordan is not the hero that this generation needs. Like Jordan is kind of dangerous because he's so obsessive. Maybe this brother needed therapy, 
not not an not an NBA career because <laughs> all he cared about was winning, and and it's sending a, a message to people, especially young people, that hey, this is what success looks like. It means being mean to people, punching your teammates in the face, being a workaholic, and caring about nothing but winning in a world where you know other things matter too, guys. Friendship, relationships, enjoying the present moment. What's your take on that? Is Jordan a bad role model for being so obsessed with winning? No, I don't. I don't think. I mean, just to say being bad because you're obsessed with winning is that's kind of crazy to me. I just think Michael Jordan, in itself, like winning was everything, and, and it, it mattered. He, I think, he said that I want to win, and I want my teammates to win too. And so he he had this sort of pressure that he would that he would apply to them in in the practice moments in the teaching moments where you would see this pressure he wanted to make sure you were ready for um the real battle practice is not the real battle practice is where i can see if you win the battle i have one of uh my brother the one who i'm closest to growing up we would uh we would have fights like he would fight me and i would never fight him back i thought he was a bully i thought i would hurt him but i would never fight him back um and then until one time I was in seventh grade, he was in sixth grade, we had a four hour fight and we never fought again after that. And if you have conversations with him now, he would tell me that, and all my other brothers, he said, I did that so that when uh, somebody come to you and want to fight you, you'd be ready. So I wasn't going to fight you to the point where I would hurt you or kill you. He said, but now if you ever get in a fight, first of all, you know how to take a punch. Secondly, you know how to win. And so <laughs> you and you, when you want to be a winner, you have to go through what it means to win. And so it's, it's always that guy that's going to be up front that takes that leadership role to say, hey, we're going to have to do it this way. And if you can't do it this way, you are not, you don't belong on this team. You're a piece to somebody else's puzzle. So I don't have any problems with it. Mm. Uh, you know, I what think, think for me, what, role model? What, I, what I found was really interesting is how, how just kind of sensitive he got when this conversation came up, you know, I, I yeah, at yeah. the end of episode, I think it was at the end of episode seven, where he pretty much had a break. He was like, cut this. Um, and and I, I, I think he said something along the lines of like, look, I don't have to do this. I don't have to have this documentary. Like, I don't have to talk to y'all. I don't have to get um, berated on like what kind of leader I was, what kind of teammate I was. I don't have to, I shouldn't have to explain my desire to win. It, that's just what I wanted. And if you didn't want to play by this regimented mentality, if you didn't want to step up to my level, yes, I was going to ridicule you. Yes, I was going to just bring it to you every time because I'm not playing with anybody who can't keep up. I'm not going to drag you. Um, I'm going to motivate you, but you don't belong on my team if you're not prepared to win. And I think to an extent, like this is the same mindset that Kobe had. And in, in large part, looking up to Kobe as, you know, the figure that he was for my life, it's a mindset that I've definitely attracted to and, and, and tried to embrace. And I think what was clear was that, like, Jordan, this, is, this has followed him throughout his life where people have criticized this kind of intensity, this kind of obsessiveness. And Frank, like, I think he showed that it hurts that like his desire to win um, is the way he just goes about it. And it has results and you can't argue the results. And it's hard to justify that desire though. It's hard to put it into terms that are politically or emotionally or spiritually correct. It, 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 it's, it's just a beast that you decide to entertain and you decide to take it to the highest levels and the people who accompany you on, their, on that journey you prepare them, but you're not going to lessen the pressure, right? You're, you're going to let that thing go and, and you're going to step up and, and be that beast. And I think, I think just, you know, whether that is friends, whether that is family, like there's only one Jordan, no, whether that's his wife, like nobody can understand that inner beast that he had. And I think what, what is evident of people who are plagued with this just burning desire to win despite anything else is that they can't explain it. Like there's no justifying why they're cut the way they're cut, right? And I think that's why he got as sensitive as he did is because he's heard it 
for the last 40 years. Like, do you like, why do you treat people like this? You know, wh why does money matter more than anything else to you? And it, it's really hard to explain that. It's just like, this is kind of like what I was, I'm here to do. I'm here to win. And I think, um, I think the way that BJ Armstrong put it, um, was just really accurate was that like how can you be n a nice guy with that kind of mentality you know I, I how can you um have that strong of a desire to win and and be nice and i think he said to be around jordan like you had to have an intense love for the game and i think that's what players like michael jordan that's what people who possess that mamba mentality they kind of carry like they're going to push everybody to that level and they're going to test your commitment to the craft that you say you're committed to because if you are committed to that craft like you say you are then you need to elevate with them and i think that's just really hard to explain to people who aren't committed because there's no justifying that level of intensity it's just it it, it gets results and for people who want to win it's a proven, it's a proven methodology. And I've, and I really feel like some of us are kind of born with this inner desire to just push harder than the expectations that were, you know, placed upon us. Yeah. You know, it, it reminds me that there was this stage in my life where, um, I was super broke. I was working at a restaurant and I took every shift. I didn't take any days off. I worked doubles like every day, sometimes 13, 14 hour shifts. Thankfully, I wasn't married. I have nobody to think about but myself. And that's all I did was work. And I had a lot of goals, a lot of dreams. And um, it made me feel really good that there was something that I could do to move my life forward. And there's nobody who knows me from this stage of my life that will tell you I was calling them up on the phone, complaining and asking for advice. I was happy. I was healthy. Um, people would ask me for advice on how to stay motivated, but I was good doing me. But one day I came to work, my manager pulled me aside. He says, hey, everything okay? I'm like, why is this guy asking me this? I'm like, your happiest customer. I'm the only dude that comes to this restaurant every day. Like he actually wants to work. Why are you asking me this? And, and he was like, well, you're working a lot. Is everything okay? And this is a manager that looked out for me and I trusted him a lot. And it occurred to me at that moment that he thought I might've got into some, into some gambling trouble or something because I was working so much. He thought maybe I had like some scary financial problems. And I was like, no, 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 man, I'm good. You know, I'm just going after my goals. I'm getting after it. I'm trying to make this paper. And he and and he was like, well, what's going on? I told him about my goals, and he says, well, you know, just just don't forget to, to stop and smell the roses. Don't forget to enjoy the moment too. And I remember him just sounding so out of this world to me because I'm like, dude, I am enjoying the moment. Enjoying the moment is when I take great care of my customers and I get a thirty percent tip. You know, enjoying the moment <laughs> is when a couple that I served last week comes back and demands to sit in my section because I take so much pride in my job. Like. This is smelling the roses for me. And it occurred to me at that time that not everybody relates to a concept of happiness that's intense, ambitious, and driven by a goal-oriented perspective. Everybody that I know kind of believes that happiness is something that each person has to decide for themselves, that we're not all happy doing the same things. But I think for most people that takes the form of like recreational stuff or whatever it may be. But I think there are just some people who genuinely feel happy from a lifestyle that's oriented around like competitiveness and drive. And so I don't think Jordan is as miserable and unhappy as people think he is. I, I think that was his fulfillment to live that way. I think he just found out a little bit late in life that he's hardwired in a unique way and most people aren't like that. And that's where we see the emotion because I think he realizes that man, he hurt a lot of people. He alienated a lot of people and he really feels misunderstood like, it made him out to be the bad guy. But I think he's a good role model if you understand him in context. I don't think being like Mike means you need to try to alienate people and punch your teammates and just focus on winning championships. It means decide for yourself what winning means to you. That means being a good mother, that's great. If that means you know uh, changing the world, that's great. But decide what it means to be a hero for you and then be un unapologetically focused on that to the point where you really get after whatever you think your calling is in life. Hey, I know we're at 310. We got to wrap it up here. Stro, take us home, man, with the final word. <laughs> yeah, I just, I think that 
just to wrap up what you were talking about with Michael Jordan and the people around him, it was funny that some of the guys did talk about how he was in practice, but they were better for it. You know, a guy that he beat up the most or gave the most trouble was Scott Burrell. It didn't seem to affect him at all. It just, just said that, you know, he calls Michael Jordan a friend and someone who helped him out. So, you know, being like Mike in that regard um, is okay with me. You know, I've, I've been the one that's been, you know, dealt with toughly and I'm better for it. So um, with that being said, you know, I had a good time and um, hopefully we can discuss again. Thanks. Yeah, man. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Stro Pena, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next no week. Doubt. Final two episodes. Peace.